If you don't turn in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, in a very familiar passage in the tenth verse. We will not be long in here today, so we're going to leave the kids in. I know they can squirm, but we'll be okay with that. Y'all remember growing up in church where mama pulled that ear and said, sit down, sit still. So if you'll stand with me, please, in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, starting the 10th verse. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of the dark that, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after having done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always Keep on praying for all the saints. Let's pray together right now. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for how that you transform us through your word. I thank you for our families in this church. I ask you that you will uh, just allow us even to hear your word today and let it transform us. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. We live in a society right now, and I, I know most of you, as you look around, uh, right they're debating even lessening the decency laws on television, and they're lowering the standards where you can have more profanity and more nudity at an earlier time in the night, uh, where it used to be family time. Now there's a greater assault on regular television, not cable television, to happen. Our families are under assault, as everybody in this room knows. Our families have to deal with things that, you know, our grandparents never had to deal with, but we're having to deal with now. There are things that we're going to find that probably in the days ahead, it's, it's, it's not getting better because we're all probably living in what we call the enlightened age where it's a greater enlightenment and things change and things go on. In our society of damaged goods, let me put it this way, not defective workmanship because we're all made in the image of God. Everyone is made in that image. You look at what's going on even today. You look at all the folks that are around. Now, how we dress that image up is a lot different than it was even just a generation ago. How we even address family issues and what families are all about and even how we define families. The workmanship is not in doubt, but our fallen nature is in great need of being redeemed. One of the things I believe as a church and what we need to do is always keep, and I hope that our kids will always understand this, that, that a family is defined with a man, a woman, and children. A family is defined that way, and you'll find all the way back in Genesis. And what we see in the assault on the family today, and that's why even today as we make a commitment at the end of this service, there are going to be some specific things we're going to commit towards. Because I believe we're, we're living in a time where everything is trying to be redefined, whereas we grew up in more of a society that when something was this or that, then you'll find that's what it was, and that's what you grew up believing. It was just understood that way. I still, I grew up in the old days of where when you did not say yes, sir, and no, sir, or yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, that was great disrespect. I can still remember some of our kinfolk that came down from the north, or even, let's say, the south Florida area, um, there were some that north, south, to Florida. Anyway, I can still remember that they would come and they thought it was a great novelty. Even in my day growing up, when we would go in and say, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, they thought, that is so cute, you know? And that's just the way we grew up. That was the way you had a sign of respect for those that were in authority. I still, and I can't get this out of me because... I'll be on the soccer field, and i got a bunch of folks, and some of these soccer parents that are here today and some of them are joined that, that we had as far as a part of the soccer team and stuff, but they know. I sit there with the kids on the field, and we got kids from all different backgrounds, and, and they'll start looking at me going, yeah, no. And I was like, wait, you either say yes or no or yes, sir, no, sir. We're going to do it this way because Coach Donnie rules on this field, and that's the way it's going to go. I believe there's a certain standard of expectations. Even the Marines, you can't get away with yeah and no. 
And uh, I do believe there's a certain standard of expectation that our kids will, will raise up to if you expect it out of them. If you expect them to do certain things a certain ways, it's like a comic I saw the other day and, and how things have changed. The comic showed like in the 60s of when the child did awful in school, you showed them standing there by the parent and, the, and the show them standing there in front of the teacher and they're looking at little Johnny saying, what is wrong with you? Why aren't you studying? And they said nowadays in the year 2000, they're standing there yelling at the teacher, what are you doing wrong? My kid's not this dumb, you know? And it's the change and the shift of how we see things and where responsibility lies. We redefine a lot of things in this day. We redefine the family. We redefine what sin is. We excuse whatever we do not want to deal with and even excuse a lot of times bad behavior. I remember standing outside of Columbia and a courthouse. I was leaving there one day. I'd been down there doing something. I was leaving. This kid, I say a kid because he's probably in his 20s. He stopped me and he's looking at me and, and he said, Sir, I may even have my chaplain shirt on and uh, identify with the sheriff's office. And he looked at me and said, Sir, can you tell me where the impound? He didn't say, Sir. He said, Can you tell me where the impound lot is? And I said, I don't know where it is. I, I don't have a clue. He, and he, and uh, he said, Well, I'm trying to find my car. Uh, the police took it away last week, and I looked at him, and I said, let me tell you something, son, because he had bling in his mouth that's put in that way. I said, let me just give you a little understanding here. If you want that car back today, take the bling out of your mouth, turn your hat around, and say yes, sir, and no, sir, to those a little bit at least 10 years older than you. He looked at me like I'd flew in from another planet. It didn't hurt me a bit to tell him that. And I understand that we redefine a lot of things today of what respect is. We redefine a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm appreciative, and I'll say this, and I said it just a few minutes ago. I'm appreciative, and I hope the military never gets to the place where they redefine it, what respect is, of yes, sir, no, sir, that you have a some, certain amount of expectation there. I've told young people this. I said, you'll either be respectful here or if you want great disrespect, you know what? I know a lot of jailers and a lot of corrections officers that will make you have a sense of respect when you get locked up. I said, because it all starts somewhere. It starts in the family. It starts somewhere. We have a lot of questions today about what morality is. We redefine it, and it was redefined through a society that has less Bible knowledge and some of the greatest tools of applications you can get on your smartphone and everywhere else we redefine a lot of things because we do not read the bible as much as a generation even ago we find ourselves too busy and so where do we find and where do we pull from our our morals where do we pull our standards from as a family we're under assault you don't believe me you watch what the kids are watching that's who's teaching our kids that's who's teaching our young people. An hour a week in youth. And y'all bless Jessica and Larkin as we rejoice with them. They're probably sometime this afternoon heading towards Cancun. Isn't that awesome? And they didn't take us with them. I don't know what that was all about. I don't understand that. But what we have today is we spend an hour in Sunday school. We spend an hour on Wednesday night. And we try to train our young people here. But families, let me tell you something. If you're not doing this on a daily, regular basis, I'm even talking to the grandparents of every influence that you have when the kids come over. One of the things I know I appreciate, and my nephew Derek, who's a pastor at Homewood Church, one thing he appreciates, my mama helped raise those two kids because my sister was working, my brother-in-law was working. Those kids understood. One of the first things I taught Derek to say was, Ma, don't smoke. I figured I'd use the grandchild as a weapon, you know. But he was trained, in by, and we called him Ma. My mother trained those kids as a grandparent on how to love Jesus. Now, I didn't negate what my sister, she wasn't there during the day when they, before they started going to school, but Ma would train them in what it meant to love Jesus. Grandparents, don't negate your role. Your role is more than giving out $5 when they head into the door. Your role is to be that godly example of raising up that standard, a biblical standard. Because even with all the tools that we have today, with all, I mean, you can get whatever version of the Bible you want on an application. You can carry it wherever you want. But at the same time, I think we're the most biblically illiterate generation that's been. I say that's my opinion. Because when you start asking Christians just simple questions... And you have to argue with them about the simple questions that, were, that was just a given just a generation ago. 
And you have to argue with them. Is it right to live together before you're married? Well, we love each other. And you have to argue with Christians that's grown up in the church. Is homosexuality still a sin? Well, it's being redefined a different way, but the Bible says it still is. And so I look at all this and I'm going, what do we do in this generation in which we're living? Genesis was where God created the family. You'll go back there, you'll find that even as I know my wife has taught him many times, that's her love, and it should be ours also, but it's her love on evolution. The whole reason they try to tear down the creationism. Evolution is a theory. The whole reason you try to tear down creationism, if you can tear down the very foundations of these, this word right here in Genesis, the family is next. Tear it down. You don't believe me? Look at how we redefine a family today, however you want to. Now, Buddy is in our family. Buddy is our little Yorkie mix. He's my dog. He is in our family. But I'm not marrying Buddy. <laughs> there are things you just don't do. Now, you can call it whatever you want, but there are things you just don't do. And what I find fascinating in the time in which we live, the family is under such an attack of how things are being redefined. I don't care what the courts say. The courts can redefine however they want to. Bible does not change. There are things that's going to remain the same. What I find fascinating, too, is we find that we try to prove the Bible to be wrong in a lot of ways, but our lifestyle proves it is right. It will prove ourselves. And the Bible tells us this, that God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that he also reaps. If we sow the flesh, we reap from the flesh. If we sow the whirlwind, we reap we sow the wind, we reap the whirlwind. Those are things that I look at and I say as a family, we start we've got to seriously look at. I, I wish and I pray that we can. The Covenant Presbyterian Church has what's called the Covenant Presbyterian Church of America. Ollie's been good to work with the church over in Bessemer, and we're gonna work with them some more, try to get them some help on a building out there. That they're working on their buildings leaking. We're trying to get some things working out with that. But also, I'd like to connect up with that in the black community because I think they have things that we could add to them that we, they could add to us. Because the most segregated hour in America is, is, is really right now. And the reason I say that is because in the black community right now, 72% of all the children are being raised by single parents and mostly mamas. The highest incarceration in prisons right now is the black man. The highest... Of, 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 and you're talking about they, they have the smaller part of the population, but the highest incarceration rate in prisons is the black man. Now, if you put two and two together, the disintegration of the family, and you find that with the disintegration of family, then the disrespect is there, and therefore you'll find that there is no respect for those around. That's what's happening in America today, and that's a small microcosm. The reason I say I'd love for us to be able to share in the black community some things, but I believe they can share some things in ours that can help strengthen families. There are some things that, that you'll find out in, in the black community. They've got some things that are really good. And I look at what we can glean from not only just there, but I look at the families that we see that are intact. Start looking around, finding those families. Then look at very close and see why they're intact. Most of the time you're going to find, even though George Barna did one a study years ago, he's like the George Gallup of, of Christianity, and he talked about the evangelical church having as many, the divorce rate is the same as being in uh, any other church. The evangelical church, evangelical conservatives, they said had the, 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 the same amount, but then they went back and they started doing a little more particulars on that, and they started looking at it, and they said that really in that study, what they did not find is that um, they didn't ask how committed they are to a church family. They asked if they were Christian in the survey. And they asked if they identified with evangelical Christianity, and they did. But they didn't ask how committed. Now, here's the, the thing that I would tell us here today, and this is a great crowd. I, I love seeing this. We're going to grow this church even more. But I want to grow it and, and see us grow it through our strengthening of our families. You know, Sherilyn has got a great things planned out this summer as we look at this. Come be a part of these things. You know, these, the Family Fest Wednesday night. If you don't usually come on Wednesday night, come. Eat some watermelon with us. Watch Jenny Pittman in the three-leg race. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be great to see that. Jenny and Betty, when they get going, there's no stopping those two. We may be picking up pieces later, but there's no stopping those two. 
We tried to get Sue last night out there in the dance line, and uh, I said, man, I was going to do my flip and into the full split and everything, but they, everybody talked me out of it the last minute. <laughs> Thankfully so. I told him I did that one time. I think I was in college, and we were roadies for this one particular guy that had a disco set up, and uh, Frank Poole, he was, I still remember that, and he needed somebody to come and load the equipment, so we did. It was a junior high dance. You ought to see two college guys. It was Lynn Thomas. I'm telling on him. Two college guys on the dance floor at junior high trying to get them to dance. I was out there like John Travolta. <laughs> doing the goofiest dances I could do. And I did the split once and that was it for the night. <laughs> Didn't work too well. But I find that even what George Barna talks about in the evangelical church, and this is where the ammo is being loaded up, and they're saying, hey, divorce rate's the same in the evangelical service as it is anywhere else. It's even in 30% range. And so what you find, and, and what I see, here's one of the, the quotes out of this one I looked at. It said, couples who regularly practice any combination of serious religious behaviors and attitudes, that means they attend church nearly every week, read their Bibles and spiritual materials regularly, pray privately together, and generally take their faith seriously, living not as perfect disciples, but serious disciples, enjoy significantly lower divorce rates than mere church members and the general public and unbelievers. That is a stat if you dig in and you find that. You'll find that people can deal with things a lot better when they start looking and they start finding in their lives that the stats can tell you one thing, and you can look at society and say how things are being redefined. But what I find is that as the family, as the family goes, so the society is going to go. So our responsibility is to strengthen the families, and it's going to start with each person taking their roles seriously. Whether it's a grandparent, whether it's a husband, whether it's a wife, even as the kids, you don't just get a pass because you're a kid. You're still responsible. Even as we see these kids being baptized today, we're going to put a responsibility on them that they're doing things before God, that everything happens in His sight, and that I have a responsibility before Him. I find it fascinating in 2 Timothy, and you'll see this, and I find that as I shared with you, how things are being redefined. Stats don't lie a lot of times. And they tell us exactly what's going on. But in 2 Timothy 3, in the first verse, it says, But mark this, there will be terrible days and there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. You know, the highest uh, population growth right now is the Muslim community and the Hispanics. The Europeans... We have 1.5 children. Now, that half child gets in the way a lot of times. Why is that important? You know, I find that most of the times, and I talk to folk, and I hear people say this, and, and it, it's one way of looking at life. We can't afford any more kids. Folks, I'll tell you. One thing I, 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 I know Sue's sitting there smiling. You never heard Chuck say that in Julie. I'm serious. I love their family. I love it. Because I watch, and I watch what happens, how they've nurtured each other along the way. Even Chuck, and you'll see Scott. And I, I mean, you love every one of those grandkids. And it's a blessing from God. But I look at this, and I say, how have we bought into some things of the world? And we say it's, it's no big. Oh, you look in China where they say that you've got to abort so many babies because you can't have this or you got that's why one of the greatest the largest adoption countries in the world right now is China and then you'll find Russia is also why because they don't value the family or they can't afford to have and you look at those kind of words and we buy into that even as I can't afford not to have any one of my three kids the enhancement of my life because of them you know I was laughing at Ethan because we're at that age I am anyway at that age to where he comes up and it's, it's about daddy and we hit each other. I always get hugs out of him now. And I realized this morning as he was hugging my arm right here, as he stays that close, I can't hit him. Uh, and I was like, you're just hugging me just to hold on to my arm, aren't you? He said, yes, sir. But I love, I can't afford not to have any one of them. You can't afford to have any one of your grandkids. You never know. And this is a thing that I realize more and more as the older you get and the more you see in these generations, I find that this is the salvation of this country, but to raise them up in a biblical knowledge, understanding the ways of God, 
understanding there are consequences to sin, and sin has not been redefined. It's still going to be the same, and the same price you have to pay. You'll find in Ephesians, I'm not going to read it right now, we're running out of time. I'm not going to read out of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, but go back over and look at that. Look at roles in households. About the submission of hearts to the Lord. They're there. Children obeying your parents. They're there. That's, a, that's one of those commandments with a promise. Your days will be long. And I learned early that mom could cut my days off if she wanted to. If I didn't obey her. So there was a great fear of God in my life. Here's what I want you to hear today. I want to finish this part out with this. What I read to you in Ephesians 6 chapter. Because I believe that this is where we are. We're living at a time where if you were to take this personally, I would say families, finally be strong in the Lord. There's a key right there. Of learning that strength that is in the Lord. The world cannot give it to you. The world didn't give it to you and the world can't take it away. But finally be strong in the Lord. You have got to strengthen who you are in Christ. Your commitment today, and this is where I'm going to start and I'm shifting gears here. I'm start talking about your commitment as a family. You listen to me as a grandparent, a great-grandparent, a parent. Maybe you don't have kids, but getting your heart ready for that means that you've got to be strengthened in the Lord. There is never a day off. Never a day off. Every day you get up, you've got to be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Then you put on that full armor, and as you look at this, why are you doing that? Well, folks, if, if you're not looking enough at society, go look at society a little bit and figure out that what's going on in our schools. We send, used to be one of the most trusted places you'd send your kids. But look how many kids are being abused even in schools. You've got to be involved so you know those. I don't turn my kids over to the greeter at Walmart no matter how happy they are. They can put a smiley face on me. That don't mean I'm going to trust them. I got to know those who are laboring with my kids. You know, we start talking. It's a different world. We were talking about, and, and I'll go back to when we were planning the Good Friday service. It's just different the way we look at things. Talking about doing a community service. Are, are people going to trust kids to go into a community bank of nursery? You know, I mean, those are things you think about now. Because everything that's going haywire, can go haywire, is going haywire. Be strong in the Lord. Why? Because you're taking your stand against the devil. There's a real enemy out there who is wanting to destroy our kids. You don't believe me? Who ever thought about taking prescription drugs? Or no, let's just put it this way. Taking your old antihistamine, mixing it with a little bit of air conditioning materials, and then taking it as a drug and smoking it. Who ever thought about that? Making sense. I mean, Larry, think about it. You didn't grow up. Let's go get some Freon and put in here and get some whatever else poisons they put in here and let's smoke it. I mean, we're living in a different time, young people. If you do drugs, it will kill you. It will draw you away from your family. You won't have any teeth. Our chaplain that does our drug awareness part of our chaplains whew, he shows the before and after pictures in just a short amount of time it will kill you it will take everything you have from you if you don't play games with the devil he always wins be strong because he's out there trying to destroy i mean who would ever thought some of the stuff we're dealing with today that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the powers and principalities. Do you realize even right now where we're sitting, there are scheming devils and demons in the heavenlies scheming against your family right now. They're making plans. They didn't take today off. We're going to go home, take a nap, eat some dinner, and take a nap. They don't take time off. That's why you get some of those weird dreams after you eat pepperoni pizza. They don't take time off. That wasn't God. Anyway. I'm off on a tangent. Therefore, put on the full armor. Now, here's what I want you to hear. Identify the enemy. This today and this commitment today, identify the enemy. It's not your husband, your wife, or your kids. Identify the enemy. We're going to make a commitment to do that today. Identify the enemy. It's not the person that you see. It's not flesh and blood. There's a real enemy out there. Do you realize if you could see the whiteboard, or let's say it's a blackboard, in hell, your child's name is on it. 
and there's a scheme of how they're going to destroy your child. And if that doesn't scare the bejeebies out of you enough to get you in a place of prayer, because all they got to do is watch the generational curses that have been passed down, and they've got it written on their blackboard in hell, how they're going to destroy so-and-so. Every day they get out working that plan. Do you pray every day? Identify your enemy, then second, you've got to stand in the biblical truth that you know is truth. It has not changed. This is a commitment I want you to do today, is you're going to identify the enemy, and then say, I will stand in the biblical truth that I know, and I will pursue that biblical truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Know whose you are. Shield of faith, which is a power of prayer. It start, extinguishes all the fiery darts. Do you realize every one of these young people, and y'all look at every one of these young people, every one of those young people standing up here today, just because they walk out of here baptized, just because they've been in church, there are fiery darts that are being fired at them every day. Now, you may be old enough where you don't even feel them. There are things the enemy could mess with you back when you were in the 20s they don't mess with you about anymore. You're going to settle that. But there's still fiery darts every day. What puts that out? The shield of faith. Helmet of salvation knows whose I am. Folks, here's, here's the commitment I ask you to make today. As you read through that Ephesians 6, take it home today. Here's what I ask. Identify your enemy. Identify there's an agenda against your children, your grandchildren, your family. Identify that. See the generational curses for what they are. Men, if you've got alcoholism in your family and you're drinking, even social drinking, stop it. You say, that's awful bold. Is it wrong to drink? No. It's wrong for my family too, I can tell you. Because I, I can show you we couldn't handle it. There are things that, are, that you can say, I can do that. Do it. I don't want to risk my kids or my grandkids. I will choose not to. I will choose not to. Families, listen to me. The strengthening of this community is how strong we're making our kids, how well they know the biblical principles in which we are instilling in them. We can't do it on Wednesday nights or Sunday morning. It's a community family event every day of the week. That's the commitment we're making. Now here's what I ask. We're going to close this part out. In your commitment today, would you pray? Would you commit that I will pray? We got some stuff. That's yours. I'm going, I'm going to preempt you. Then you're going to come do it. But I want you to know that everything in this life, see, it's supposed to be a group thing, but my mind shoots like a, a shotgun. I want you to know this. The strength of this church is truly in these families. The strength of this church is truly in how well we're praying for those, the next generation. The strength of this, any church, is going to be how well we're standing in the biblical principles knowing there's an enemy out there trying to destroy every person in here. But I'm telling you, their kids are valuable treasures. And if they can destroy them, wow. Dads, take your biblical stand. Be the spiritual man of your home. I know Father's Day is coming up. We can talk about that. Moms, we need you on your knees praying. Grandmamas, don't just spoil them rotten. Pray them rotten and make them real. Pray all over. Make them so sick that you're praying for them that they're going to know that they've got a God that loves them. I mean, grab them by the hand when they come in and say, I'm going to pray for you right now. Right now. And don't let them leave till you get through laying hands on them. They're grandkids. They won't go anywhere. Let's commit ourselves today. How you want to do this, Shep? I got to quit. how God works. Berta, come on up. Berta and I have been working together uh, these last couple of months trying to develop a family focus uh, that would strengthen the family unit in faith. Uh, it's funny because uh, even before Donnie started preaching, I started writing down the, the things that I thought God wanted these families to recognize and commit to, and I, I promise you they're almost identical. Not in the same order. Uh, <laughs> But we're going to ask the families, I'm going to let Berta talk for a minute, and we're going to have you come on up and go through a formal commitment process here.
Well, one thing that hit me this morning, um, I'd like for Mindy and Debbie to come up because I'm going to try not to cry, but, um, and, and Sherilyn, we all.